Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 197 for Monday, January 21st, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that's by, for, and about working musicians. This episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash giggab. We'll talk more about that later here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? Doing pretty good, Mr. Hamilton. How was your weekend? Uh, weekend was good. We had to enact the uh, the snow policy for one of our gigs on Saturday night because there was more than four inches predicted, and it looked like it was actually going to be kind of a mess. So, uh, so we wound up nixing our monkey fist gig on Saturday night. Actually, the club did while uh, well, while we were all kind of talking about it together. But it, uh, it's funny when it, whenever you tell me about these types of things, being out here in California, I cannot imagine the hassle of driving to a gig in the snow. Loading in and loading out in the snow and the cold like that. I mean, it's it's just unfathomable yeah. to me the amount of hassle that would add to everything. It it adds hassle and it's you know it. I mean, then there's the safety factor, right? Driving home at night in the snow and you know people on the roads may have had a few too many or whatever. Like it's just better not to have to deal with that. And uh, yeah, years ago we had a, a gig where we drove home in two feet of snow and. No one wanted to call it off at the beginning, and so we enacted this. We 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 conceived of this snow policy, where if more than four inches is predicted before the end of the gig, anyone can cancel, and there's no repercussions. And but you might get judged because you know obviously <laughs> we're in a band together. But but like you know we all understand because we all had that white knuckle drive home that uh, that fateful night a couple of years ago. So yep. yeah 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 yeah. All right, man. So I'm really happy to say that we have our first guest in a while. I've invited my good buddy, Dan Meblin, who runs one of the great Bay Area corporate cover bands named Pop Fiction. Dave, meet Dan. Dan, meet Dave. Hey, Dan. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I asked Dan on here. Dan's group, Pop Fiction, is really you know one of the one of the stellar groups in our in the geography that I live in. I mean. Everything from their musicianship to their presentation to the way they run their business always struck me as, as really one of, the, one of the top of the tops in this area here. So I, I thought Dan would have some pretty cool stories about how his band came to be, how he runs his business, and uh, you know what his history as a musician is to take this path of kind of corporate musicianship. So Dan, I'll just start by you know, asking you, I don't know, I think you played in, did you play in the Eric Martin band? Yeah, I did back a, a thousand years ago. So the Eric Martin Band was a, a very promising local original band that got a lot of buzz around here. I'll let you fill in how far that buzz went uh, and just give a little bit of a background about your history as a musician, how you came to play with Eric Martin and how you've ended up you know, going the cover band route. Yeah, well, um, uh, yeah, when I was young, I, uh, I auditioned for Eric's band. He had just been signed uh, and, uh, somehow got in that band, toured with him, did records with him. And, um, and then he lost his deal and then he went to start this band called Mr. Big, which is, that's where he had his big oh. success was Mr. Big and, and, uh, some hits that he had with them and Paul Gilbert and Billy Sheen and all them. So anyhow, I went off and, uh, pursued a career in, in computer graphics, technology, stuff like that. But, you know, I still sort of had my musician chops in my back pocket. And, um, um, then at some point I just got laid off from a high paying job and, and, uh, got a call from one of these big cover bands that, uh, that plays in the Bay area. I didn't really realize that, that, the, that these types of bands even existed, that you could make this kind of money and play this, this kind of huge show with uh, a cover band. And so I sort of had my eyes open to that and uh, loved it, you know, and uh, immediately got into uh, another band um, and did that for about six years and met a lot of great musicians doing that. And then we finally decided um, about 10 years ago to just 
all jump ship from that band and start our own band, which is Pop Fiction. So um, 10 so years ago, we, we made that leap. Got it. So let me unpack this. So you were, you were an accomplished guitarist, obviously good enough to get into a, a, a band that was uh, being signed. And, you know, so you're, you've been a guitarist for a long time. Yeah. You have this great experience, but most of your experience, most of, most of your view of the world was through original music. Yeah. Uh, and, and then like many people who listen to this show, you know, you go off and you get a day job and, and, you know, you're, you're living your life and then the stars kind of line up and a, your passion for music opportunity, you know, the day job, becoming not as available and i would imagine your interest in and in kind of answering the call of your music muse right and and all of a sudden you're finding that uh that there's an opportunity to to try and piece together a living through me like were you, when you first joined the first cover band after you left your your computer job were you thinking you know i might be able to piece together a living like this or was, was it a was it a temporary it was scary it was really because I, I i came from the world for all these years where you know you got a paycheck every two weeks and everything was taken care of. I just bought a house, you know? So all of a sudden it was like the whole income thing really scared me. Um, I I somehow I got through that. I got over it and and I figured out, you know, you know, Hey, I've got a job. It's not a normal job. Sometimes I have, you know, four or five days off at a time or more, but, uh, you know, I, I figured out how to make it, make it work. And, um, um, I think that one of the things you have to kind of, get past is, is, uh, you know, you have sort of different goals when you're in an original band, it's about selling records and being famous and blah, blah, blah. And cover band, you have to sort of put that aside and you're just, you become an entertainer and your job, you know, is to make people have a great time and to get gigs and, and, uh, and, uh, you're not playing your own songs anymore. You're playing cover songs and you have to kind of learn, to love those cover songs. I think that's the step that a lot of musicians have trouble with mm. is they sort of go into this going, God, I hate this song. I hate this song. And I, you know, I've sort of learned to, to, to truly love them, you know, cause I love the reaction that the songs get, you know, you know, Absolutely. I, I, that's, I mean, that's a great lesson. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta you learn know, what I mean, them. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, sometimes the dumber the song, the better. I, 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 I always think it's a challenge to take the dumbest song and enjoy it and make people enjoy it. Like my, my best example is Copacabana by Barry Manilow. I sing that song almost every night. It's like the dumbest song in the world. It's like, you know, but you, you can take the dumbness of a song and turn it turn it into something entertaining, you know, and, and the, the, the funny reaction you get from people when you start playing a dumb song like YMCA or, or, or Copacabana, or I could name a few other ones, you know, that's kind of part of the entertainment, you know, that you played something sure. dumb that they all went, Oh, I guess I like this. You know, I don't know. That's how I look at it. So Dan, I, I'm really interested about the formation of pop fiction. So, you played in some other cover bands, got some corporate work, got a taste for it, and you're in a, a band that's actually was you know in the area that's that's playing for much, and and something caused you to want to go out and strike out on your own. First question was Pop Fiction the first band that you've ever owned, managed, and run yourself? Yeah, Pop Fiction was the first. Uh, the first. I mean, I had no idea how to run a band or book a band or anything. I just had to kind of figure it out. Yeah, as so, I went along. You so know, tell me as, about as this. You were in a band that was giving you some work, and you were moving along, and yeah. you decided to move out and form your own. Yeah, we just kind of we got to the point where we felt like we could do a better job ourselves, and and uh, there was you know just a lot of ah, I wish I'd do it this way, boy. If if I was running it, I'd do it this way. So at a certain point, we said, let's just go do it. And um, and so many and, of the members uh, of Pop Fiction are yeah. from that last band. Yeah, from the from the other band that we that we played with for six years, five of us all decided to to just disembark and 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 start our new band. And we had no gigs, we had no nothing, you know. Um, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think it took us about three months to get our first gig. Um, uh, we, you know, I just took that three months and was I worked on audio demos in my studio. We recorded. Uh, we took pictures, built the website, um, and, uh, 
And there we, there we go. You know, and, All right, so um, let's back off for a second here. I, I just want to ask about a, the musicians. Oh, you go ahead, Dave. No, I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is, is like the business side of this, because running a successful, you know, a highly successful cover band in that, like, like you're doing where you're getting corporate work and, you know, getting the, these high paying gigs that everyone, like, I, I, let me put it another way. I see yeah. this happen all the time where somebody says, oh, I'm forming a new band and, you know, we're just starting out. We're going to play some club dates, but we're going to go after all the weddings and corporate work. And it's like, do you have any idea how to do that? Right. So my question for you is, how did yeah. you have an idea how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we have been doing we've been doing it in that other band for six years. So I, I was, you know, getting familiar with the process and how it works. I, I wasn't involved in communicating with clients or booking the gigs, but I knew how the gigs themselves ran. Yeah. And so I knew a lot about production and I knew all the venues and I was getting to know some of the agency people and, um, you know, the planners and the, and the things like that. But, but honestly, I think the thing that made our band take off is it, people just found us. Um, we had a website and you could Google us and you could, you know, we had good demos and, and, I just had, I focused in my head, you know, I can't, there's things I can't control, you know, but what I can control is the quality of my band and I can make a killer band and I can make killer demos, killer videos and, and recordings and promote it and people will find us. And All right, let's pause and that, right there because I've got so many questions about, about the, yeah. the beginning of the band. So first I want you to talk about the, the musicianship of the band. Like yeah. is everybody that was in, that joined you to start pop fiction. They have similar backgrounds to you past touring musicians, past professional, semi-professional musicians. Yeah, pretty much all of them were, were on that same level, you know, and, and, and that really helped, you know, I, I had a real good group of really talented people that all kind of had the same mindset. Like, Hey man, let's make some money. Let's, you know, the sillier the songs, the better, whatever works, you know? And so, everybody kind of was in that same camp that we all, you know, understood that we were entertainers and, uh, and we weren't trying to be necessarily cool up there, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. I had some really, really good players and just, you know, that's how, it, that's how we started. I think we did get noticed as, wow, this band sounds really good, you know? And, uh, you know, I recorded some really good demos uh, right in the beginning, spent a lot of time on them. I'm at, it's funny because I'm actually working on another round of them now, you know, and it's been, you know, it's a lot of work to do that, but, uh, yeah. but it pays off. And, uh, you know, uh, well, the other thing that I still to this day take very seriously is, is public shows. Um, there's a lot of these corporate bands that, ah, we don't, we don't play publicly. Ah, it's too much trouble. We don't make any money, but we do it. We play clubs. People pay buy tickets to come and see us and we advertise them, uh, you know, on social media. And, uh, and that's really key. And, uh, like what we were talking about earlier before we started the concert in the park series gigs and the, the city festivals and, uh, and those types of outdoor gigs where the public comes, those are key, you know? Um, I mean, here's a story. Um, um, we just did a massive corporate gig earlier in 2018. Um, two shows back to back, like a crazy amount of money. And that client just was happened to be at some concert in the park with her family sitting there, had no idea she was going to see Pop Fiction and loved us and, you know, got my name off the, the website and booked us for a massive, you know, corporate show from like a fortune 500 company. So that's how you get those gigs. Sometimes it's just being really good and, and getting in front of the right people. What, you know? per, and, what percentage of your gigs would you say come in that way versus what, what I'll call repeat business, which I realize, you know, when you're working yeah. like with an agent, sometimes the agent's booking you with someone new, but, but that agent you're a repeat with. So yeah, you but know, I, like, I'd actually add to that and, and say how much of your corporate business is you beating the bushes, going out and getting business, going out and pitching mm. your band. Oh God, you know, <laughs> not that much. It's, it's kind of hard to just go knock on a door at Apple or something like that. And, uh, um, 
you know, they, they usually find you, you know, they're not, they're not that accessible. Um, um, we do have some agencies that, that we work with, um, uh, you know, I don't know if, if I, I'd say maybe 25, 30% of, of the, the corporate gigs come through the agencies and the rest come from us direct. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I make calls. I mean, if, if we've got a client that hired us last year, I'll check in with them or usually an email and just say, Hey, just, you know, if you're thinking of having another party, let us know. And, you know, and I'll, I'll reach out to them and stuff like that. But, you know, I've, I haven't really been known to just go and bang on a door of a, of a, of a strange company. I've just, I, you know, yeah. maybe I should, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. One thing I want to ask you about Dan seems to be working. So yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's funny is that it, jobs change so much. So, you know, you, you may have some great contact at some big company and then you email them a year later and, and the emails returned and they're gone and someone else is there. And, and uh, so it's never easy you know, keeping in touch with all these people. But the other nice thing is <clears throat> people move around to another company. So, you know, a lot of venue managers, once you play the venue and they really like you, they start recommending you. Cause you know, you know, wedding venues and corporate venues, they, they don't want to have some, some unprofessional group coming into their venue and being a pain in the butt. They'd rather work with somebody that, uh, that they know is going to come in and do a good job and, and be respectful. And, and, uh, so, so we get a lot of referrals that way too. You go and make a good impression in some venue and then the person in charge of the venue starts referring us and they're not even making money. They just, they just want to make their life easier yeah. by having a cool room in there rather than a bunch of jerks. So that's, um, that's a good lesson for everybody who's listening though, is like yeah. those venue managers, like you said, they might not be the ones that appear to hold any purse strings per se, but they are in a very influential position on both yeah. sides of the equation. So if you're a dick, when you come in there, you know, like that's going to, they're going to, that's, somebody's going to notice and say something about that. Exactly, Similarly, if you're, exactly. if you're really accommodating, even if it's just the venue manager, you know, you walk in, you're like, Hey, what can we do to help? They're not the people that hired you. So it's easy to be dismissive of them. Do not, not only are they no. good, just human beings and you shouldn't dismiss them anyway, but there might be a financially beneficial reason to be nice For too. Sure. Yeah. And Dan, yeah, I'd absolutely. actually ask you, uh, let's get Dan's tips here. When you say they appreciate the professionalism, what are the three or five essential components of professionalism that you put in? You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to put a pin in that right there. I'm going to, I'm actually going to give you the opportunity to think about those three to five things, Dan, because okay. I'm going to take a quick minute and talk about our first sponsor here, which is express VPN where at expressvpn.com slash gig gab. You can get three months free with your one year subscription of this awesome service. You know, we're talking about going to different venues, different event halls, different clubs where you play. Maybe you got a coffee shop next door to a club where you're hanging out. You bring your laptop, you bring your phone, and you connect to their Wi Fi. Who controls that Wi Fi? Who's sniffing that Wi Fi? Who's seeing what you're doing, right? As musicians, we run a lot of our lives on the road. And that means connecting to, you know, our important emails, of course, but other things like, you know, different accounts and banks and things like that. And you want to make sure no one knows where you're going or what you're doing or is sniffing the data that's going to any of those places. And this is why you want a VPN. And ExpressVPN is the best VPN I've ever used. And I'm actually quite happy to be able to say that. It works so well. It it's one click, right? You install it on your phone, you install it on your laptop, whatever, your tablet, you connect to the VPN, and now that creates a secure tunnel between you and the outside world. So no one on that local Wi-Fi can see anything that you're doing. The most they could see is that you're connected to ExpressVPN, nothing else. And for something that costs less than seven bucks a month and is the number one VPN service is rated by TechRadar... And that comes with a 30 day money back guarantee, man, this is an easy okay. no brainer, right? So if you don't want to hand over your online history to your internet provider or the internet provider at the club or the person who manages the Wi-Fi at the club, right? 
then you need ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash giggab. You got to go there. E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash giggab. That's three Gs, two together and one at the beginning, G-I-G-G-A-B. Three months free with a one-year package. Expressvpn.com slash giggab. And our thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. All right, Dan. Now you're on the spot. Dan's with tips. Three to five. Okay. That's right. Dan's tips. Okay. All right. So this is how to uh, how to treat a venue well. I, you know, I would say that the, the the very first rule that I have, which is the last thing that you do when you leave that venue, is don't leave any garbage. I swear, this is so important. Um, a band makes garbage. You know, there, there's set lists and water bottles and batteries, 30 batteries sometimes, you know, cause we just, we, you know, have all these little transmitters and things. And, and, and so at the end of the night, there's all this stuff. You just go and you make sure that then, you know, so you go, Hey, you have a garbage can you go and you pick it all up. And I always say, I don't like to leave garbage with my name on it. Cause you know, my name is on that set yeah. list and they appreciate it. Even if they, even if they've got uh, a janitorial staff that comes in after they're like, wow, that band, like, you know, we're like campers. We like came in, you know, set up our stuff and then cleaned it up. And it looks like no one was ever there. And honestly, that really is a big deal. And, and, um, it's usually me at the end of the night doing that when I do the idiot check to make sure we didn't leave anything. And I pick up all the garbage and I just, I think people really appreciate that. But, uh, other things, uh, you do, th this is another one that's, I can't tell you how important this one is, is to do a site check. You know, if, if, if you're going to play at a new venue, you've never played at before you make an appointment with, with that venue person. Hey, I want to come on a Monday afternoon and I want to look at the whole venue and they love that. And I, I don't even like doing a gig unless I do that because I, I need to know how do I load my stuff in? What's the pathway? Where do I park? Where's the electricity? Is there enough electricity? Where is it? Do I have to run? You know, all that stuff is so important because you don't want any surprises. It's worth, you know, blowing away a few hours of your day um, so that you can ensure that the day of the gig, there isn't going to be some crazy thing like, oh my God, this, this area isn't big enough. There's no power, whatever it is. Um, you, you, you discover all those things ahead of time. And it's a great opportunity to get, you know, a better relationship with the people that run the venue and the planners right. and everything. So they, a lot of bands you're like, yeah, oh, we don't do that. No, we don't do that. I have learned that a lot of other companies don't do that. And that's exactly why I do it. You know, um, that's one of the things you can do is find out, you know, you know, that's um, great. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, that's a great yeah, tip, yeah. man. Yeah. That's, that's important. And, um, um, you know, just, just, you know, paying attention to their rules. Um, you know, don't, you know, don't go to the bar during the gig, you know, a lot of venues, you know, frown upon that, you know, unless, you know, the client has told you, we want you to go have a beer, you know, but, uh, you know, you, you got to be careful of that stuff. Um, don't play too loud, obviously, because so many venues, you know, they're not nitpicking. They literally could like lose their license or get fined if they get noise complaints. So, you know, they know how loud you're supposed to be. And the second that someone from the venue comes and gives you the motion to turn it down, you got to turn it down, you know? Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's one of those things that for someone who hasn't played in like a corporate function band, uh, you, you know, you are up there to act like, and look like, well, act like it sort of with an asterisk and certainly look <laughs> like a rock band, right? Because that's the yeah. experience you're delivering to all these guests. But volume wise, you are rarely, there to sound volume wise, like a rock band, you know, some gigs, yeah. sure. You can open it up and let it fly, but 90% of the time you're going to be at half the volume you would be for a rock gig. Cause everybody needs to be able to hear the vocals need to cut through. You don't want it muddy in the room and you really need yeah. to learn to re to reel that in. And it's not, and it will also still, of course, delivering the energetic show that you were hired to do. So yeah, it's, that, yeah. that's, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Stage volume. I mean, we've all, we've all 
been told this since we were young. It's like, keep your stage volume down so the engineer can control you. And it's really important. That's you know? it. Yeah. Cause um, when, cause like you said, when somebody comes up and says, you need to turn it down. If the engineer's got one, if, if that's the per one person that can do all of it, your life and your business just got a lot easier. So, yeah. 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 No, exactly. Exactly. And, but the problem is, is if the, if the band, if their stage volume is crazy loud, you know, you know, doesn't the, matter. The sound engineer can turn the PA off and it's not going to matter. So everybody's got to be kind of in control, but stuff like that is really important, uh, you know, for the, exactly. for the venue. Um, and, uh, um, I'm yeah. going to dig into that while you're, while you're paused there. I, I, you know, it, so that the, the gear you use matters in that regard. Right. So I'm curious, yeah. what do you guys, do you guys use, is there anything live on stage or is everything coming out of like in ears or are you using monitor wedges or a mix of both? How does that work for you folks? We, yeah, this is a really good question. We, um, you know, we definitely invested some money when we first started 10 years ago, we didn't have any of this stuff. But we actually made it a priority. I think within the first year, we set up our in-ear monitors because we had been doing that in the other band. And we got, you know, once you, it's like once you go in-ear monitors, you can't go back because no. they're just amazing. Awesome. You know, um, know. but it's not, it, you know, it, it, you can't just kind of go to Guitar Center and set, you know, it's it's a big process. It's and, a process. And yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the, everybody has to sign off on it or it doesn't work. You can't have a few wedges. Well, we do when we have horn players, they'll use wedges. Um, but, uh, but basically it starts out by getting, you have to have your own monitor board, um, that you take with you everywhere. So what we did is, um, well, we started out with another one, but then, uh, maybe five or six years ago, we, we upgraded, but we have a Behringer X 32, yep. um, uh, which is rack mounted. Um, so we have this kind of rack that looks about the size of a washing machine that has this Behringer X32 in it and um, the digital snake that goes along with that. And then all of our um, transmitters are racked in there along with uh, a patch bay. And so it's just this kind of machine that we just take to every gig, you know, and even, even and especially those concert in the park gigs where you've got barely any time to set up, you know, um, um, and the whole stage plugs into this patch bay, um, on the front, um, <sighs> which has all 32 inputs. Um, sometimes we have sub snakes that make it a little easier. Sure. Uh, most of the time we have sub snakes, but, uh, but you know, it's labeled one through 32 kick snare, blah, 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 all in this beautiful patch bay in the front. And then there's a split that splits it out to our front of house board. And when we bring our own front of house board, we have a matching Behringer X32 sure. front of house board. Um, and so we just take a cat five yeah. out of the, 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 the monitor board, which is also a Behringer X32. And, and it's real, just one chord. Oh, it's just one together. chord. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then once it's all in, we all have iPads on little stands. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion about, iPads, but uh, we all have little mic stands with the iPads on them, um, and so there's an app on that uh, on the iPad where we control our own mix. But the beautiful thing is, is you know this is the only band that we use this rig for. So you just pop your ears in, and they sound exactly like they did at the last gig. You know, yeah. So um, even so, you, just so people understand, yeah. I, I think I'm grokking yeah. you here, but even when you're playing somewhere where say someone else is doing front of house and they have whatever yeah. board is installed in the system, all they do is plug into your sort of, you know, home built patch bay. They don't, you don't plug your kick drum into their snake. You plug everything in to your own stuff and then give them a split feed out where they can plug yeah. into your patch bay. They can do whatever they want. It doesn't affect your ears, your gain, your mix, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, I mean, that's everyone, brilliant. Everyone wants to know, uh, yeah, no, we have, we have 32 tails that come out of the back of this. We have exactly. a, a snake. Yeah. We don't have to use it when we use in our own front of house board. Cause we just use the cat five, but you just use the cat some five, other venue, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But we go to some other venue, we bring the snake every once in a while, you run into a particular venue where they want to use their split because it's more isolated. I don't know. And yeah. then you end up with a little gain structure issues that are a little different. Sure. But you, you deal with them. The other thing that's that you'll notice is um, 
uh, sometimes we'll go to a venue where we're going to use their mics um, instead of our mics, and they might have you know different drum mics, and so the snare all of a sudden is louder or something. And, sure. and uh, you know, but but they're not they're they're not huge hurdles, you know. I mean, I, no, I, that's a pretty, I you know, like you said, when you're starting with the mix that worked perfectly at the last 10 gigs for everyone have yeah. to, to have to go and adjust the snare and, and maybe, you know, that horn mic or whatever, that's not that big of a deal, especially because, you know, yeah. the two things that it is, right? It's like, oh, well, we yeah. know that those things are different. So we'll pay attention to yeah. them as opposed to yeah. starting from scratch. No, yeah. You get used to that. You really get, it's like, we literally don't need a sound check, especially when we're when we need kind of a line check to just make sure there isn't a bad chord somewhere, but we really don't need much of a sound check because you know, all these boards are you boot them up and they're exactly the way they were when you left them yep. and you can even, you know, save presets. So, you know, we have the same sound engineers doing all these gigs. So they, you know, we're playing in some venue in San Francisco and it's like, Oh yeah, we played here eight months ago and they have a saved file of that mix from eight months ago that they spent, you know, four hours perfecting, you know, the EQ for that big room. And then it's just, you pull it up. It's like, Oh, here we are again. It's, it's like magic, you know? Well, and part um, of, but part of that magic, I mean, certainly part of it is this, this rig that you've set up and, and the thought you've put into yeah. it. But the art, other part of the magic is that eight months later, you're coming in consistently and being and playing at the same levels and, you know, delivering the same thing to that engineer, or if there's something different, yeah. you know, but I mean, that takes some talent too to, 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 and some diligence yeah. to make sure you're doing it right. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, another thing that we'll do sometimes, and sometimes we'll just, we'll just offer this just cause it's easier for us, um, is where you, you know, I mean, we have one next week where we're going into a big venue in San Francisco um, where they've got, you know, national acts play and everything. So they've got a whole crew there and they've got mics and, and, and cables and a front of house, this and everything. But it's, it's so much easier at, at a certain point for us to just come in self-contained. Um, and we bring our own front of house board that we put side stage and then our engineer mixes from an iPad. Yeah. But we just basically just give the big house. We just give them left and right out of our board. And, and, um, so, um, you know, they don't, we don't have a stranger at this, at this venue mixing us. We've got our own engineer, on our own gear mixing us. And we just take left and right out of our Behringer board and run that to their big front of house and, uh, just makes everything so much easier. You know, oh, no, that's, that's do- brilliant. Yeah. That's really, yeah. really smart. And, and, you know, understanding, uh, you, you know, you built this thing so you understand how it works. So if you are interfacing yeah. with an engineer that needs something different, you, you've, you, you know, you can have that conversation, which is really yeah. like, they'll love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 That's but, you know, it's hard to have a stranger mix you, you yeah. know? Um, um, I mean, we do it sometimes when we have to, but it, you know, it's, it's usually easier to bring, we have, you know, th- maybe three or four different, maybe three sound engineers that we use. Um, yep. and they've all done like hundreds of shows with us at this point. So again, hey I want to you know, change the topic here a little bit. It's no it, it's still under awesome. the umbrella of professionalism. You guys do something I think is pretty interesting. You clearly have made a very conscious decision about the presentation yeah. of your band, the dress of your band. Um, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's themed. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I just want to understand how did you come to this? I mean, I actually think it's, it's, um, uh, it, it's a level up from what most bands even attempt. Is this your idea? Did everybody buy in from the beginning? What all went into talk about the presentation of the, of the product on stage? Well, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Yeah. We, um, um, we came from a band where we were very costumed and to the point where it was kind of overkill. You know, we wore kooky, goofy costumes and, um, you know, bell bottoms and platform shoes and, you know, sparkly this and that, you know? And so we kind of had enough of that. Um, we will still do that upon request when there's a client that's having like a disco party or something like that, we will costume if they're having an eighties party, we'll, we'll costume for that. But, um, we, um, we adopted a look for pop fiction 10 years ago that I just kind of called dressy flashy. You know, um, um, I don't like tuxedos. We will, it's kind of the one thing we won't wear is a tuxedo. We'll wear black suits, you know, and that, but the level of tuxes, we, we don't go that far. Um, 
you know, you just, you don't want to look like a waiter. You don't want to look like somebody, you know, if, if you're walking around on the break and someone asks you for, to, to, to get you a drink, you know, you're, you're wearing the wrong thing. <laughs> and that's happened many times. It's, I'm just, okay, sure. And I'll go get them a bowl of soup or whatever they wanted. But, um, but we, you, you want to look like you're in the band, um, but you need to look, uh, dressy. So we, we have some rules. No jeans is the first rule. You never want to wear jeans at a gig, even at a nightclub. Um, that's always what, I, what I've felt, you know, it, it, you want to look expensive, you know? And so, and so no jeans, guys are in ties. Um, and, uh, we usually do some sort of matching thing, you know, where we, we say, okay, we're going to wear black and white with red, you know, or black with red or gray with, you know, um, and so we're not in a uniform, but we all kind of have this color scheme that ties us all together, whether whether you got a red shirt and a black tie or a black shirt or red tie, everybody's kind of, we look like we're all supposed to be there. We look like we're all part of the same group, but we all have our own styles and, you know, but you know, the flashier, the better. I mean, I, I, I have all kinds of great coats and shiny coats and, you know, shiny ties. And, you know, I like to look like, you know, and that's all about just not looking like a waiter. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, you take, you take the band up to that, to that level. Um, I just, it just makes you look like you're worth more money, you know? Um, so no t-shirts, um, and no yeah. jeans, you know? And, uh, so everybody in, in ties and we just, we kind of just look, you guys look great a little all the more time. I've never seen you not expensive, look. Absolutely. You know? And I agree with you. You look like you're yeah, worth the money. And you. then the music backs it up and, the, and then the sound backs it up. And so it's really all the components of putting something out there that, that is, you know, if you're going to ask for it, a, a fair dollar for it, you got to deliver on all ways. And I, I think you guys do a great job. I want to ask you a question about, um, about your approach to the business. Yeah. So again, you leave this, yeah. you leave a day job. You start mm-hmm. to find your way, you know, under someone else's employment. Then you go out and you start your own thing. And so you're, you, you are a small businessman. I think I've seen pictures. Do you actually own staging yeah. that you rent out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I, I just, um, I did that two years ago. It's so funny. Just on Facebook, it just popped up as a memory right before we got on today. Two years ago to the day was my first gig with my stage I bought. Um, not funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I own a lot of stuff. I own a lot of lighting now. I just, it all just came, kind of came out of, uh, playing gigs and I'd but see it's a stuff line at the gigs and up lights was they the first thing I found. They can hire the band with sound. They can hire the band with sound and lights. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, this is just part of your business strategy is to be as self-contained yeah. as possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. It's like, uh, how do you make more money every year? It's like, well, you can't, it's, it's hard. It's hard to bring the band's price up too much, you know? So it's like, hmm, I want to make more money at this gig. I already got to be at this gig 10 hours. Yeah. I might as well bring some lights and get paid again for the lights, or I might as well bring a stage and get paid for that. You know, I just, we just try to figure out and everybody in the band pretty much has their hands in, in one piece of this or, or has been offered to if they, if they want to. Um, uh, there's a lot of things like, like, you know, one event, you might need four sound systems at one event. You can't go moving sound systems around events. So, you know, especially a wedding, they're going to need maybe a sound system for their ceremony with all the wireless lavalier mics that go along with that, you know, and then dinner might be in a different place, uh, you know, in a tent or something, and they might they'll need a sound system in there and a wireless mic and an MC in there. And then, you know, there's just a lot of different things that, that clients need. Um, uh, the one thing I, that we, our, our base package, we don't charge for, you know, our sound system and our stage lights. Uh, that's just sort of our, our price. I guess, you know, if, if, if every once in a while there's an event where we don't need lights or sound, obviously we will discount because we don't have to bring those things, but they're pretty much included in everything. And, and um, the stage lighting uh, that we bring, it's not extensive, but it's nice. It's, you know, these Chave four bars, I really like them. And then I can, strap other lights to them. I've got some kind of dance floor moving disco lights. I strap onto those. So I don't even charge for that. And the reason for that, it, this goes way back. Um, um, I've, and this is something that everybody should, 
should follow. Um, it happens over and over when you, you got a gig and they go, Oh no, no, we're, there's a lighting company there. You don't bring lights. They got, they, they're taking care of lights. And I go, okay, we won't bring lights. And then you show up at this gig and there's like two yellow lights pointed at you that never change all night. And you just, you, you look like a, uh, you know, a chicken at KFC, you know, getting, you know, it, it's not exciting lighting. Um, you know, um, and, um, it just happens, you know, every once in a while, maybe you'll get lucky and there'll be a, a proper lighting or if it's a big enough venue, but so many times, especially these kind of corporate events where it's not a venue, like you're going to play at a big old club or something. It's, it's just some event space, you know, and they've hired some lighting company. The, the, the lighting company will light the crap out of the walls and the, the venue, but their idea usually of lighting a band is two lights that don't change. And so that looks unexciting and boring and, and, uh, uh, so I just always have the lights in the truck always. And, uh, and we light, we don't even charge the client for it. We just want to look cool. We want to look colorful. We want the lights to change color and blink and fade and do all the things they do. So that's my rule. It's like, we always light ourselves and, and, uh, I just got tired of showing up at gigs, Absolutely. you know, not being lit the way I wanted to be lit. So, um, anyhow, um, yeah. And then the, the other things we offer are sound systems, different sound systems for different areas. Um, that's, that's big business. And then two years ago, yeah, I bought a stage and that, that just came out of, um, just enough clients saying, do you have a stage? How much is, where do I get a stage? And I was like, wow, I should probably buy a stage. I never really wanted to deal with, um, you know, schlepping it around, but this, they're, they're making them pretty lightweight now. So the one that I bought is called IntelliStage. Um, and it's in these four foot sections that's, that snap together and it's manageable. I'm just a regular size guy and I can lift this thing myself and put it into a regular sized van, um, cargo van, not a minivan, but a cargo van. Um, and so I kind of waited around until there was a, you know, a, a type of stage that I could, I could deal with myself. And, uh, so yeah, it's just another thing that I can cool. offer to the client, you know, that's so smart, um, man. My newest thing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I, every year there's new things. Now my, my, my new business for this year is, um, arcade machines, big video arcade machines that, uh, play all the old retro so you really are the arcade, machine, or arcade the games. I mean, the music is one um, of the, I see the main so. service and everything built around that, but you do. Yeah. It yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you rent that. I mean, we play retro music, and you rent that stage yeah, out right. to other to other people, right? So, so that's yeah. that's like the, yeah. the 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 Neil Sean model, right? He because he um, yeah. what was the story? He they created their own video wall system, right? So people way back in the in the stadium could still see who was on stage, and then the Stones called them, right, and said we want to use that. So they, yeah. they built another, and now you know, and then they they were fueling all of rock and roll for a couple of decades that way. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's smart, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get into every aspect of it. Uh, you know, I can, I might as well. You know, um, and all these all these things like staging and now the arcade machines. You know, I'm just, uh, you know. I hear more and more about, about events where I oh, know they had a DJ and oh, they had a silent disco and oh, they had a, this, you know, I mean, I, I hope we don't get to the point where they stop hiring live bands altogether, but, uh, but I'm definitely, you know, I want to have eggs in different baskets, yeah. you know, so that I can still participate in these corporate events, um, that don't have bands. You know? So how long so until you, you become an agent yourself and when you're booked for a night that somebody needs a party, you <laughs> hire another band and take a cut. I, I do a little, I do a little of that, yeah. but it's so hard. Yep. It's, it's just, it's, it's hard to, to, um, to book a band you're not in. I mean, I, I, I've dabbled with it. I even tried putting bands, other bands together and it was just really hard. It was, it was, you know, it's hard enough to, 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 to manage the band that you're actually in and playing in, right. you know, try, try do it, try, try and do it for a band that you don't play yeah. in, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's really no, hard. it's not easy. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I, I don't know. I, I maybe at some point I'll, I'll get into that again. I was thinking about having a second band and then popping back and forth between, you know, the two bands, but 
don't know. It's uh, at, at some point. At some point, and you I'll clearly do that. got a model that yeah. works. Yeah, of course, Your band is terrific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything about it. Every ex- uh, we were on a build together. Just the professionalism of the guys in your band and women in your band. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly your insistence on taking attention to the details has been paying off great dividends. You've just been a really great model. I know for my own band, I watch you guys really carefully and, and, uh, you know, it's just always so impressive. Uh, I just love the insistence on quality and attention to detail. So, uh, the success is well-deserved. Absolutely, man. And, uh, well, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. What? I, I have a question for you, for, for, for you, Paul. Um, hmm. How do you do with rehearsals? How often does your band rehearse, and how do you how do you uh, manage once that a week with your schedule? January through May, and uh, we rehearse, and most of what we do is turning our show over every year. So we, you know, trying to introduce as much and somewhat to keep mm-hmm. us, you know, vibrant and excited, and some somewhat just to keep it fresh. I mean, we play a lot of those festivals and concert series, and we want when people come out to see us. To always have a different experience. A lot of people like see us, they'll see us two or three times in a week. And so we don't want to play the same show. So our, we're always trying to make our, our repertoire bigger. Uh, we do do um, vocal specific rehearsals about once Very a month. Cool. Where we just, just the vocalists kind of get in and we work on, you know, vocal arrangements and that type of stuff. But it's our, our rehearsal schedule is about a five month deal. Wow. How about, how about you, Dan? How Very often cool. do you, you folks rehearse? We, we, we do it. We, we try and do it at gigs, you know, we try and do it at sound checks um, because we have this opportunity because most of us have to get there with our equipment. Yeah. And so, and, and we, and, and because we've got the in-ear monitors and everything, there really isn't much of a sound check we have to do. So we're like, Hey, we got an hour. Let's, you know, so we try and do most of it, most of it there. And, um, and um, that's cool. Uh, some yeah. of it through email. Yeah. You know, <laughs> emailing ideas back and forth, but but it's we, yeah. We try not to. Uh, we have a thing where we all kind of live far apart. That's the thing. We all live. Some of us are two hours away. I have people in Sacramento and then in San Jose, and you know, so there's you know, there's some great distances. You know, what's funny when we first started. This is an interesting little little anecdote here. When we first started ten years ago, you know, I came from the the tech world, and so um, I actually was working at a tech startup. 10 years ago, 2009 called, uh, musician link. And they made this product called jam link. And it was this thing 10 years ago. And it was a ultra low latency, uh, audio device that you plugged into your computer, hooked it up to the internet, and you could actually play music through the internet. Um, with, what? you know, in sync with each Did other. It work? Yeah. And, and, it, and this was, Yes, it worked. It was amazing. What? And, 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 um, so this was 10 years ago. If you go on YouTube and you, and you type in jam link, there's a video of me like at the NAM show, um, 2010 NAM show. And, but I'm sitting in my studio in near San Francisco, jamming with people on this, on the, on, on the show floor in Anaheim, um, through this box. And, uh, so it, it, that was about as far as we could take. It would be about, you know, 400 miles. But, um, and you know, there was a noticeable teeny bit of latency, but it was, I could play with a drummer that was wow. in LA. Um, so, so yeah, and this was, you know, we live in Silicon Valley here, so there's all kinds of technology being developed. And so, um, we were the test bed. Pop fiction was the test bed for this thing 10 years ago. And I had this situation where I had, you know, um, a, like a 200 mile loop of where all the band members were. And so we're like, let's put this thing to the test. And so, um, we had, uh, every Sunday night, a rehearsal online with this jam link box and we all had them and, you know, um, and plugged into them and we were, you know, getting 20, 25 milliseconds of latency, which is nothing. That's, that's the same as playing with a drummer that's 20 feet right. away from you. It's like 20, right no second so it's totally doable and um and uh so we used this thing for god like a year and a half when we were first getting started learning songs and and uh um i don't know the company is still around the website's still up but it was it was a real niche market yeah you know? um but it's funny just just the other day I, I had to rehearse uh with one of my singers 
Um, and we just kind of did it through Skype just to check on the keys of songs and, and arrangements, things like that. And, you know, I mean, there was maybe 200 milliseconds of latency. So you can't ever be in sync when you're doing it on Skype. We could see each other and we could talk, but it was more like, here, this is the part and I'd play it. And then we would sing it back, but you couldn't do it at the same time. But yeah, with this box, we actually all could stay in sync. It that's amazing. Fun. Huh? Oh, that's yeah. cool. I had no idea that thing existed. Jamming. We've talked about it like, you know, in our, you know, in various bands, we've, everybody's had this conversation. That's really interesting. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what, what they, what they found out is it's the, the, the operating system of your computer is what adds all the latency. Well, it's the audio so, processing of it. Yeah. Yeah. Packaging it up and sending it through the yeah. OS and then out the internet. So this box was basically its own computer and it had this teeny, teeny little transparent miniature little OS that could, that only added like two milliseconds. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. When it's purpose know, built the, and, and you can, and you pull the hardware yeah. together, it, it totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, it, it didn't just work itself. You had to, you had to have a pretty good setup yes. at home and you needed to have headphones and the right microphone. And, and I mean, I have a little home studio, so it was really easy for me to feed everything from my, from this room into the, you know, the, the sub outs of my board that, that went to this box, you know, but it was funny. I, one of my jobs was to sort of, um, uh, seed the market. So I had cases of these things that I was to give out to all my sure. friends that were in similar bands. And I gave out maybe 50 of these things. And I swear, like, I don't think anybody used it. I don't think they ever really like made yeah. the leap to figure out. Well, yeah, maybe, like, like you said, it's not the kind of thing where you get it and you're good to go. You have, you, there's a yeah. lot of heavy lifting you've got to do on your own to leverage the the power that this thing brings. Yeah. 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 Well, this yeah. has been so awesome, awesome, man. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. <laughs> That's Covered awesome. a lot of ground. Hey, 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 hey. Yep. Yeah, we did. Very good. Yeah, very absolutely. good. Yeah. Cool. Well, people can find you at it's popfictionlive.com. Is that right, Dan? Yes, popfictionlive.com. Make sure to visit that, folks. Popfictionlive.com. For us, visit giggabpodcast.com and come join our uh, our working musician support group at uh, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. Dan, thank you so much for being on with us today, man. Thank you. Always be performing. Take it easy.